I, I think that's part of it is I think we have so much pride in our culture and hyper individualism and humanism to be honest I can do it myself right and so I just think that's dangerous I can't I know I can't do it myself and I don't think God wired us for it right. he's always created us for community and you're gonna find community one way or another right mm -hmm. whether you find it at the local pub your group of pals friends whatever you've gone to university with or you find it in the gathering it's just when you gather with the people of God, and we talked about this in the last episode, the idea of belonging actually matters, and it matters when we belong to diversity. Welcome to Down to Earth. I'm Jessica De Sabatino, And I'm Joyce Reese. And this is a show where we want to be real about God, the scriptures, and how we live our Christian faith out in real time honoring God and shaping our culture and community around us. We dialogue about the purpose of vocational artists, social justice, generational transformation, why we bother with church, and a whole lot more. We're Joyce and Jess, and we're friends, pastors, and speakers. We thought perhaps we could work on this project together and have a little fun. Our goal is to talk about things we have passion for, connect with others about what matters to them, and together impact our world and honor God. Here we are again, this is episode 12, and today we want to talk about, continue our discussion, I guess, about church, and particularly look at the worship gathering, the structure of the worship gathering, why, where does it come from? I think it's important that we recognize, I guess from the outset, our goal is to show that worship, the worship of God is rooted in the story of God and His people. So we're going to have to go back, and this is going to be a little bit more heavy, sort of biblical emphasis. Because when the emergent church movement happened, we talked about that in um, episode 11, there was a great deconstruct, and it was important, super important, to be asking questions. But like we said in that episode, I think the pendulum might have swung a bit too far, and we checked out a bit of the baby with the bathwater. So then there became this resistance to the worship gathering, like, what's the point? It's just a bunch of religious trappings, right. and I don't need any of that. I can love Jesus and sleep in and have brunch Right, with my and I can just friends. go have a neighborhood party. And right. that's church. Right, which of course, like I'm going to push back on that because that is a common yeah. theme among some sort of people who, who've who abandoned institutional church or or just in general, the worship gathering. Right. I mean, I think in my own city, I know people who would say that church is just befriending my neighbors. Right. And I go, no, because like when you're with your neighbors, you they're not laying their hands on you and praying for you. You're not receiving spiritual gifts from them. You're not making you're not, a joyful noise unto the Lord. Right. You're not, you know, diving into the word of God to learn and grow with them. And you're not taking communion with them. Mm -hmm. Like there is something to be said for you're being a Christian. Mm -hmm. Right. And we're all called to be Christians yeah. in the world. World and with our neighbors and love on them. But that is not... Ecclesia. Right. And so we need to talk about what is Ecclesia, what is the church, and what is the purpose of the worship gathering. So, And, and I actually think this is really, really important for us to understand because when we have offense or when there are things that we disagree with, when we know the purpose of the structure, it's, it's a lot harder for us to say, well, then I'm out. Right. Because we actually have some theological grounding on why we do what we do. And it, it, it helps us to weather storms. Sure. And to bear one another's burdens, right? Yeah. Even if the burden is, I don't agree with you or I dislike you. So you have to learn to, yeah, be in community with people that are not just same, same. And we talked about that in the last episode. We all know that worship has <laughs> way more to do with than, you know, just singing a few songs on Sundays. Worship is everything to do with how we live and obedience to God and His Word. That includes being friends with our neighbors yeah. and being salt and light. And it includes lots of things like concern for marginalized people. We talked about that in previous podcasts. But there is something important about why we gather to worship. Yeah. So I asked my kids when they were four and five, you know, what is worship or what's the point of the worship gathering? And Connor said, it's praying to God and praying for people. Mm -hmm. To him, it was all about prayer. He didn't even think of singing, mm -hmm. you know, it's just like... And it's all about people. Right. That's we have to get of... together and we talk with God and we talk with God's people and we bring one another to God. It was that kind of idea. Finley said, well, it is, it's getting together with God's people and telling God what we like about him and asking for his Holy Spirit to come on people. And we put our hands on them and pray for them. 
And so both of them felt like the essence was to have an encounter with God yeah. and to, to do that together. Yeah, and to encounter God with each other. Right, which I thought was so profound. I was like, wow, these guys have actually picked up a thing or two. Mm-hmm. Now, we never use the language of we're going to church in our house. That's like, I just didn't want to orient them to that when they were little. And we're going to be with the people of God. Mm-hmm. We're going to celebrate Jesus with God's people. We're going to, you know, we would talk like this because we are the church. Yeah. And we're the church outside of the church gathered. Yeah. And But I think it's important that we have both the church, like, you know, people have talked about the church scattered and the church gathered. Mm-hmm. And we need both. Yeah. But I think we just maybe have swung a little bit in terms of, well, we just the church scattered. Right. And the gathering's optional. I wonder if you ask yourself, what do you think? is the purpose of the gathering. I think for many of us, we just have very limited understanding. We did an entire series on this a few years ago because we we don't actually know what the point is or more specifically why we worship in a particular liturgical way in our gathering. And you might not be from like high church. Right, but you have a liturgy anyways. Right. If you're from my if you're from my tradition, which is Pentecostal, then it's two fast songs followed up by three slow songs. (laughs) followed up by somebody praying a very long prayer in which in the middle of the prayer, you will think to yourself, I need to sit down right now. (sighs) Followed up by, if you need prayer, please come to the front and somebody will lay hands on you and then we will do that section. Then somebody again will pray a very long prayer, basically do their devotions during the church time. And then there will be announcements and that is also a part of the- The liturgy. Yes. And then there will be an offering appeal, which is also part of our worship. And if you're in a really exuberant church, people will clap for the offering because that makes it more fancy. And then the offering will be taken up and somebody will get up and talk at you for an hour. And then you will maybe have some response and go home. And that's the liturgy. Right. And so we'd like to say that we're not liturgical, but I think every, every gathering, yeah. whether your smells or bells, yeah. right? And that's high church with the incense yeah. and the censer and the sung prayers and all the different bits, right? That's beautiful. And yeah. it's important for me to be part of high church from time to time. It gives me a different kind of awakening to God. Yeah. And then there's what we call low church, which is just like sort of common and less formal and you can wear blue jeans and you can sit down if you're tired and you don't have to feel like you're failing if you don't kneel and you know, all this kind of stuff. But we all have liturgy in our gathering. But what we don't often know is why. Right. Some of times we just think, oh, the liturgy is just tradition. Right. It came from way back, but I don't know where or why. But I actually want to point out that all, all liturgy, so whether you're in a smells and bells church or you're in a very low church, like, you know, you sit in a circle and you have a dialogue sermon, it doesn't really matter. All of the format fits our historical story, which began at Mount Sinai. Mm-hmm. And I actually think it's really, really important. I mean, I'm a bit of a Bible nerd, but I want people to know where the liturgy came from. Right. So Mount Sinai is when God first initiated the worship gathering. It's in Exodus 24, 1 to 8, if you want to read it. But it was the earliest worship gathering, and it's very important that we know that it was initiated by God. So you have four things, basically, that happen in that first gathering. There's what we call the call to worship. We have a call to worship every Sunday. Yeah. Uh, The band begins, they sing a song, and we leave our coffee and come and gather. And that goes back to God calling the people to come and gather at Mount Sinai. That's where it's rooted in. And then you have structure of responsibility. There's always some different ways we participate, but all the way back to Mount Sinai, it was not an audience and leaders. It was all the people of God, full participation for everyone gathered, each with his or her own part to play that's actually really important. Like we don't often think about it like that. God called, all the people came and there was a level playing field, the people with God. Mm -hmm. And then you have the proclamation of God's word. God spoke to the people, right? And they heard what his will was. It was made known to them. And that's always been the case. There's always been this two directional kind of, we hear from God and we respond to God's words spoken to our hearts. And then there's this, what we call the acceptance of the covenant or, you know, in biblical language, we call it ratifying. And it's declaring again, our willingness to hear and obey God's word. Right. That happened at Mount Sinai. And that is the pattern that went all the way through the Old (laughs) Testament and into the New Testament and through the early church into today. So 
Right, and there are dozens of examples of this throughout Scripture. Yeah. Ezra, Nehemiah, you name it, there's dozens of examples of this pattern played yep. out over and over and over again. So after that Mount Sinai covenant encounter, then the people entered into their covenant with God and he gave them the instructions, right? That was the written word. That's mm-hmm. what we know as the Ten Commandments. And then God told Moses to build a box, right? And that box we call the Ark of the Covenant and put the the Ten Commandments in there, the special instructions. And then he said, make a special tent to put the box in. That's known as the tabernacle. And it was intended to be a special place where God would dwell with his people. And it was where they could encounter his manifest presence. Right. So he's always with them, yeah. God with them. But there was a place of encounter in the gathered assembly. Right. Right? Yeah. And in that gathering place, there was the Holy of Holies, which is like the inner sort of sanctum where the full presence of God was. And this was totally in contrast to the idols that nations around them worshipped, right? God was <clears throat> with his people. He was not distant. He was very, very present. He was their king. Now, we think God with us came with Emmanuel, Jesus, and and it did in a different way, God in human yeah, form, is. right? Yeah. And like... Peterson says he moved into the neighborhood. I love that language, right? But God actually moved into the neighborhood way, way, way back after Mount Sinai. He's not too, it's, He's not a schizophrenic God. We have to actually see that from the Old Covenant to the New Covenant. God's not like one ugly, awful monster, like mean God in the Old Testament. And right. then totally he has like a brain change and becomes right. nice Jesus God. Exactly. So He is the same God. And we can see pictures of that all throughout the Old Testament. And totally important that we do see it. Mm-hmm. Right? And and we'll come to why this matters in terms of how we gather on a Sunday and what our participation can be and why. But Exodus 25, 8 says, have the people of Israel build me a holy sanctuary so I can live among them. And that's mm-hmm. always been God's desire is place of encounter and to be, be with us. But then we come through history. I'm fast forwarding, okay? But you have the Mount Sinai, you begin this covenant relationship. We have the law and sacrifice. So you have all the feast days and every Sabbath was also a feast And you keep having these gatherings where you hear the word of God, you hear God call, you respond, you ratify the covenant. But then we have what we call the Davidic period. And this is when King David showed up on the scene. You know, what we could say is that David attempted to restore true worship, which had to do with heart obedience in Israel. And he did that first by recovering the Ark of the Covenant. The box had gone, you know, the Philistines had taken it and presence of God had gone. And so they were trying to get God with them back and they needed the word of God and they needed the box that had the word in it. And they wanted to have this come back. And that does complicated process. But when it finally did get back, they had this worship party. They had (coughs) sung worship, they had dancing, they had minstrels. This idea of pouring your heart out to God is when David danced naked and scandalized everyone. And after that, worship changed drastically. In fact, I think more drastically than any other point in Scripture, we have to think about David in terms of like, David was a man after God's own heart. Scripture talks about him like that, right? He was a worshiper first and foremost. He wanted in heart intimacy and heart connection with God, which is actually why he became king. Right. And now the, the guy made a, a, a heap of mistakes, right? But right. he kept coming back to this posture of true worship, which is why we have over one third of our Psalms. Right which are songs, yeah. um, not poems, they came from David. Yeah. And uh, he also influenced worship more than anyone in history because he was the guy who set up the 24-hour, round-the-clock worship. Right. And I don't know if people realize this, but the sacrifices were taking place in one town and worship in another town. And so you had the ratifying of the covenant yeah. kind of stuff happening in Gibeah. And here in Jerusalem, you were having sung worship, right? And that... Time in Israel's history, worship involved more than blood sacrifice and prescribed rituals to cover sin. This was when the essence came about the heart connection between God and his people. Right. I think that's really important because we've kept that. Mm -hmm. And we'll talk about that in a couple of minutes, how that influence of King David Mm -hmm. and the morphing and and the reach for more with God, more heart connection came through him. And then he died, right? And Solomon built the temple. It was David's idea. He thought we should create this beautiful palace mm-hmm. for God to live in. And and re, do you remember what God said yeah. to him? Like, this You're a time, man of too much war. Your son will do it. Yep. Yeah. And he said, there's going to come a time when I'm not, you're not going to need a temple. Right. And they didn't understand what he meant. But 
they wanted a permanent place for the dwelling of God's <coughs> presence, not a tent that could move around, but something that was grandiose and established. And when they did that, when Solomon built that temple, that's when the two parts came together. So that sung worship and the sacrifice all in one place, all the feasts came together in one big kind of worship center. And then you have the prophets, and we don't have time to camp out on it. We just did four episodes on social justice, but Amos and Isaiah and others, they, Micah, they raised the kind of voice to say, you know, in Amos's words in Amos 5, away with the noise of your songs. I want to see this. More than right. burnt offerings and sacrifice, right. I want a hard obedience. I want concern for the oppressed and the poor. So all of that together became this understanding of like what's worship and how we worship, not just in the gathering or at the feasts, but in, in our life, right? Right. Okay, so then you fast forward to the New Testament. I'm covering a lot of stuff really quickly here, but I think it'll set up our conversation about how we gather and why we gather on Sundays. So you have the basic framework of the gathering since Mount Sinai. That's how synagogue worship happened. Mm -hmm. So you had, you know, Jesus got handed the scroll of the prophet Isaiah, Luke 4, and he read it. He turned to 61, which wasn't chapter verse back then, but he knew his Bible. And there was always a time where people heard the word spoken and then they would have a rabbi teach. Right. Well, that goes all the way back to the old forms. Mm -hmm. And if you weren't in Jerusalem in a temple, you were gathering in your local congregation which was your synagogue. Our <laughs> current context of like local church model is actually largely based on synagogue model. Jesus, of course, said in John 4, remember that conversation he had with the woman at, at the well? Mm -hmm. How did he say worship was going to change? He said, there's coming a time when those who worship me will worship me in spirit and in truth. Right. And this idea that it wouldn't be contained to just a building or, or a set. Yeah. Right. And that they were having the tete-a-tete you know, the theological debate about we worship in the North since the Civil War and you guys have been worshiping in Jerusalem. And are you saying God doesn't accept our worship because of the location, because of this history? Mm -hmm. And she's making, a, I think, quite a valid point. Right. And in some ways, I think she echoes her concerns, echo what people's concerns are now. Right. Are you why saying, does it have to look have like to this? this? Yeah. Why can't I worship in my bedroom? Right. Why do I have to, you know, mm -hmm. this or that? So... Jesus is making the point, it's no longer going to be about um, the sacrificial system. It's going to become a moot point. God's going to break out of the temple mm -hmm. and inhabit every willing and surrendered person. Right. Which is exactly what happened, not when he was resurrected, but the moment he died. Right. God with us all the way entered into the curse and his sinlessness, right? So the right. temple the curtain, curtain rips. Yep. It's crazy, right? Crazy town. History says 60 feet high. More than a man's hand width and thickness, yeah. Yeah. right? And the curtain ripped from top to bottom. I don't know if you've ever tried to rip a piece of fabric, but it has to be pretty thin for me I to can make barely, it rip. I can barely open up a, a jar of pickles. Right. So I got stuck on one the other day and I broke it. Mm. <laughs> that was bad. Glass everywhere. Mm. We salvaged the pickles. We washed them because nice. I was so determined. Anyway. Ten second rule. Yeah. So... The temple curtain rips. This is God's manifest presence breaking out of the Holy of Holies. And whoever would have been in the temple worshiping, you know, historically, they would have been dead. But all of a sudden, Jesus has made it through, right? And this is incredibly important. Yeah. And I think where people have gone wrong, though, I think they've heard this choice. And then they said, so that means that because God is with me all the time, I no longer have to gather right. anymore. I no longer have to. There is no need for me to be part of a local congregation because now ecclesia and people i think have wrongly exegeted this passage to mean now ecclesia means in i have my own little god private individual yeah, god. personal jesus personal jesus yeah jesus is my homeboy right. and i think that that's incorrect theology i think that's a bad exegesis of the passage yeah. i think that while god said i'm no longer confined yeah. to a box or to the holy of holies yeah. i i it is still in our best interest as Christians that we would gather together, that we would meet together. Totally. And we have to look at the New Testament history to see whether the New Testament believers thought that that was important. Right. Right. So all the guys that walked around with Jesus for three years and Jesus died and the, the temple curtain ripped and presence of God everywhere, they didn't say, oh, we don't have to gather together. No. Right. In fact, if it I got pushed them up. to be gathered together more. I mean, I read the first chapters of Acts and think, whoa. A lot of codependency going on there. They gather together every day. Every day. 
Right. Breaking bread in one another's homes. But they also gathered in Solomon's colonnade, which is the court of the Gentiles. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this is several football fields big. This is a small space in the temple. Right. I've, I've heard people say, well, like, the me this, is, this is why the, the megachurch is wrong, because people only gathered in homes. And that's actually categorically untrue. No, it's not true There was at all. a both and. Yeah. There was a both and. And so that's why we don't have to judge each other. Oh, you go to a church of 5,000, therefore you're less spiritual than me who runs a home church movement right. or something. We, there is none of that in the New yeah. Testament. So, and you look at, you know, they were gathering Solomon's colonnade, some three and a half thousand people for a yeah. worship gathering, but they moved their day of worship. And this is very, very important for us to understand in the Old Testament, everybody worshipped on a... Saturday. Right. And in the New Testament, they moved it to... Sunday. And Sunday because it was the day of the resurrection. Right. So they decided, look, on our Monday, okay, like it was that kind of equivalent. We're moving our day to gather because we're going to perpetually announce the resurrection every single Sunday. Right. So every time we gather, even if you don't really feel like it... If you gather together on a Sunday, you're announcing the resurrection. You're identifying yourself as belonging to mm -hmm. the people of the resurrection, people of Jesus. And so the early church had very formed practices around worship and the worship gathering and intentionally changed the day. Yeah. So they still gathered every week. They yeah. gathered every day in homes, but they gathered every week in the gathering, in the assembly. And so when you have all of the epistles being written to the early churches— in Colossae and Philippi and Antioch and different parts, Smyrna, these churches were gathering on Sundays yeah. in different contexts. Maybe they were meeting in Lydia's home or they were meeting on a creek side or they were meeting in a big open space in Rome, but they were having letters read out to the gathered assembly, right? Right. Um, from the Apostle Paul or from the writer of Hebrews or from Peter or John or James, these letters were being written and read in public gatherings. And they'd even say like, hey, pass this around. Right. Like you guys read it and then give it to the church 14 miles down the road so they can read it at their next gathering and make sure those guys don't get left out. They should read it and get their letters too. Right. And, and I think it's interesting that we note that wherever there was a gathering of God's people, there was also the failure of God's people. So right, I, I, right from Exodus. This, right? Yeah. You have God gathering the people and him communing. But in the and very next the chapter, the, the very next chapter, they're messing it all up. Right. So a lot of people have said, well, I just don't believe in the gathering because there's so much hypocrisy. Well, welcome to the biblical narrative. That is yeah. the biblical narrative from Exodus to David to Solomon to, I mean, we have pictures of the gathering happening and moral failure happening right. uh, to the New Testament. And you read this in the New Testament letters. There was all kinds of crazy like brokenness being addressed sexual brokenness yeah. being addressed and greed being addressed yeah. and even practices gossiping. around how they shared the table they would have you know communal meal which was a form of their communion we'll talk about that a little bit in the future but yeah they were like rich people were getting the best seats and going and eating first and the poor people were left out right so there has been a history of god's people not being perfect but god still being present there Right. And that's why we actually have to come together. And I mean, it's okay. Yeah, get used to it. Of course, there's going to be hypocrisy, all kinds of it in the church. We're broken people. But that's not a reason to say, well, I'm just going to hang out with my little family yeah. and my this immediate is, people. This is like why I like reading, um, oh, well, I'm blanking. Give me a second. Anne Lamott, Traveling Mercies. You ever read that mm -hmm. book? Like her point of conversion, you know, is this motley crew church. And I, right. I remember reading Traveling Mercies in this little Presbyterian church she describes, and it's so motley crew. Right. And I just thought that is exactly the kind of church I want to be a part of mm -hmm. because there is a sign of the kingdom of God and the presence of God there. And like, so here's this real broken lady, alcoholic, a history of, you know, real difficult relationships. And she encountered Jesus in the gathering of his people. Right. because of their differences, right? right, And because of their brokenness. It was like a surefire sign to her. She can't, I can't remember her exact wording, but she, you know, she basically said like, there is no way these people would ever all get together except mm -hmm. God. Right. And it became this conduit for grace breaking in on her. Or you read Kathleen Norris. She wrote a number of really important books, Dakota, The Quotidian Mysteries, fantastic little essay, Laundry, Liturgy, Women's Work. That's a great little essay. But in, in it, she tells how she came to faith. And it was because she went to a wedding. And I think it was a Catholic wedding. And then they had the sacraments. And then the priest <coughs> washed the vessels, right? 
and she'd never seen a man do the dishes. And she just thought, got interested in God, right? But it came because of the gathering. I think sometimes we miss that people still encounter <coughs> the manifest presence of God yeah. when the people of God are gathered right. together. It's there, different. It is. And I think um, there's been a lot of sociological work that's been done about what happens to people psychologically when we gather. And there is something powerful that happens when people gather in groups. And God knew that. I mean, God doesn't... He doesn't work against science. He works with it, right? right. So He's the one who invented There is it. something powerful. They, they in fact, did studies about people singing in groups of people. And we're gonna, you did a little we're bit. We're going to talk about that in the next episode. Right. Because we're going to talk about worship in, in particular. Right. But, but there is, is something powerful huge. that happens when we come together, yeah. which is why we're missing out on a whole important section if we say, well... I'm going to have my personal Jesus, and I'm a very spiritual person. I mean, if I had a dollar for every time somebody says that to me, I don't like the church, but I'm a very spiritual person. I, I just think, oh, you're, it's, it's not because God gives you a golden star for getting up on a Sunday morning and going to church. It's because it's good for us. Yeah. It's good for us, both psychologically and spiritually. It's yeah. good for us to be with God's people, and that's been a history yeah. Of humanity, from which the very is beginning. why Hebrews ten twenty five we <laughs> talked about in the last podcast said, "Don't give up getting together." As is the habit of some, right? Like it's actually really important for you. It's really good for you. It's yeah. transformational, and so in our worship gathering, we still have this pattern. We have a call to come together yeah. to worship, and we do that, and then we have a uh, encounter with the living presence of God, and we have God speak to us through his word, by his Holy Spirit, and then we have what we call the ratifying of the covenant, except now we don't have to make blood sacrifice because since Jesus, sacrifice is no longer necessary as part of the worship gathering as Christians because we have the Lord's Supper or the Eucharist communion, whatever term you want to use. It was given as the perpetual sign of the culminating sacrifice of Christ and his victory over evil. This is why we have communion in our context every single time we gather. So we're remembering, literally, remember as the body of Christ. We're identifying ourselves as worship of God and his people because of our covenant in and through Jesus. That is the ratifying action that we do when we gather together. You know, in Luke twenty two twenty, it's Jesus said after supper, he took the cup of wine and said, this is the cup in the new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood, which is poured out as a sacrifice for you, right? So there you see the Mount Sinai and subsequent acts of worship being replaced in the new covenant in Jesus. Romans 3 says, God's shown us a new way to be made right with him without keeping the requirements of the laws was promised in the writings of Moses, etc., right? Now we're made right with God by placing our faith, faith in Jesus. And then at the very end, it says, people are made right with God when they believe Jesus sacrificed his life and the shedding of his blood. Jesus, Hebrews talks about, is our high priest. So the idea of covenant and worship have always belonged together, but now we have this communion, the Eucharist, and we're going to talk about that in a, in a couple of weeks. But this is really, really important that we realize, hey, when I gather and I have the call to worship, and I hear God's words being spoken, or I have a chance to respond and identify. This last Sunday, the guy that was hosting the gathering, Merlin, said, hey, can anybody just say why communion is important to you, what this means when we, when we come to the table? Because he just said, we don't want to be the people who just do it by rote. And so a couple people piped up, and somebody said, well, it's the moment when I remember my belonging. I belong to this community because of Jesus and I belong to Jesus, right? right? It's both and. Yeah. So when we get in the line and we go and we take the bread and the cup and receive it and, you know, maybe for some people that's very, very liturgical. It's our orientating practice. <coughs> it's our reminder and our celebration and our announcement that we are covenant people. We belong to Jesus. Now, if I don't get together in a gathering, a worship gathering, where I get to identify with my belonging with Christ and his people, I think I'm missing the essence of what worship is for and what the worship gathering's about. Yeah. And I think we are acknowledging that we are forgetful people. Right. Part of the gathering is a reminder that we are frail, that he remembers how we were made yeah. and we were just formed as dust. And part of me gathering is a good reminder to me that I am, I belong to Jesus, but I also belong to this community. And it reminds me of the responsibility of that. Yeah, And also the care that comes with that. I think there's encouragement that comes with that. There's been lots of weeks where I've thought to myself, oh, if I wasn't the pastor, I would sleep in this morning. And then I get to 
I get to my community and I think, I am so, so glad. Right. I'm so thankful for these people in my life that cause me, you know, when I'm having a down week to remember, oh yeah, God is my, is working mightily on our behalf. Yeah. We bear one another's burdens. We mourn with those who mourn and we rejoice with those who rejoice. Right. And there's something beautiful that cannot happen if we do not gather. Right. And if you're not present, you're not going to hear those victories, right? Yeah. yeah. Or you're not and I think it does balance us out, right? So we want to always be able to have lament in our gatherings. And again, we're going to talk about this next week when we talk about worship. But if all we have is our own internal dialogue with God, we never hear the announcement of good news that's being lived out in someone else or what we call God stories in our gathering. We hear, you know, these announcements of hope and truth and, and brokenness and failure and weakness and the reach I would never make it. Mm -hmm. I swear that I got called to pastor because I'm one of the weakest Christians. It like forced me to like keep going with Jesus. Mm -hmm. But I don't understand the idea that I don't need the gathering. I, I need it. I think the b scripture bears out that we need one another and we need to be reminded and, and be formed by one another. You look at the New Testament, you pointed to the book of Acts. They devoted to themselves, to the apostles' teaching, to prayer, to the breaking of bread, fellowship, Right. Well, what were the apostles teaching? The apostles were teaching the scriptures. Right, right? they were teaching Jesus. They're, yeah, and they're teaching the Old Testament, and they're teaching the law and the prophets, and they're helping us understand how it's fulfilled in Christ. Well, that still has to happen. Mm -hmm. We still have to be learning. I still have to be learning. If I don't ever sit and hear someone else bring the word of God, I'm not going to be as alive to Jesus as I could be. Right. So, like... Yeah, and I think it, it makes an announcement to our own personal beings about our own blind spots. So there are areas of revelation that God has given me about himself. Right. But I know that there are parts of me that are still not sanctified where I where I haven't had a revelation. And so we need each other because I have blind spots yeah. that you can help me with. And we need growth. Yeah. I I think that's part of it is I think we have so much pride in our culture and hyper-individualism and humanism, to be honest. I can do it myself. Right. And so I just think that's dangerous. I can't. I know I can't do it myself. And right. I don't think God wired us for it. Right. He's always created us for community. And you're going to find community one way or another, right? Mm -hmm. Whether you find it at the local pub, your group of pals, friends, whatever you've gone to university with, or you find it in the gathering. It's just... When you gather with the people of God, and we talked about this in the last episode, the idea of belonging actually matters, and it matters when we belong to diversity. Right, and it's why we can't jump around from church to church to church, because right. you'll never belong somewhere. Right. You'll never belong. It'd be like a student going from class to class to class, because they don't like the way this teacher teaches history, and they don't like the way this teacher teaches math. So the parent, you can imagine what kind of a terrible education someone would have if they changed schools every week. Right. You never learn anything because a lot of the learning that happens happens outside of the course subjects. It happens in working through relationships. And the same is true for us in a church. So maybe you're of the notion that I, I just, I have people say to me every week, I just go where this, the wind blows me. Right. Or and, I heard they're having a move of God over here. Yeah, and so I you just go from one place to one place. I just want to strongly encourage you to work on belonging to a group of people. Work through your stuff with a group of people. When you're when you're jumping from place to place to place, it just tells me you're probably running from yourself a little bit. Yeah. Because there is something of it scary and beautifully scary about people knowing you. And about the, people knowing your stuff and your imperfections. And And I think this is also partly why we need context for people to gather in smaller contexts, right? So if you go to a really large church, and I worked at a mega church for a long time, you can have you know, 5,000 people gather for worship on a Sunday, you could still have a tremendous amount of anonymity, even yeah. if you went to that same and place I would, every week. I would, I would push back and say that unless you have smaller groups, that it's not really Ecclesia. Right. I mean, you do have the call to worship. And I mean, there are wonderful things right. about large mega churches. So don't hear me wrong. But even then, but I think pastors recognize you got to get into a small group to pray at the end of the gathering, yeah. or you have to go to a home group, or you have to belong to this book study for a season. Otherwise, or... you don't know people, yeah. and people don't know you. And I will, the other thing I will say is, and this bears out what we were talking about, one body, many parts, like get on a team and serve. Yeah. If you are at a church community where you still don't know anybody's first name, or no one really That's knows you. That's not the church you, community's fault. 
That's right. your fault. Get in there. Like, say, you know, do you need help with coffee or can I help with holding babies on a Sunday or find out what the thing is that you can do and just begin to do that. It's the easiest way to get folded into belonging and get that life on life discipleship. And for me as a pastor, right? Like it's easy to say, oh, I lead this thing. So I can't really be vulnerable or can't really, you know, I just think that's <laughs> rubbish. Yeah. You know, I have a, a good friend in our church community, my friend, Terry, I think he regularly influences me just his wisdom his life experience, the way I experienced the fragrance of Jesus in him and his wife, Angie. Just simple, humble, down-to-earth folk who've lived a really authentic life of faith and are really honest about their pain, their brokenness, their history. I need to be around people like them to remind me not to think of myself as more than I am yeah. or let pride get in the way or be too intellectual that I am not helpful to the people, right? And it's people like them or my friend Susan who so on the ground with the street entrenched community in the city and she's legend. Mm -hmm. But she's also like a 60 some odd hippie who is just a straight shooter and she's an artist and she's unique. My boys adore her. Mm -hmm. Um, She's an eccentric person. Like you were saying, praying for the eccentrics to come to your church in Toronto those years ago. She's one of those people, she adds a different kind of fragrance. I need to worship with her, Mm -hmm. need to be around her. I need to ask her to pray for me or even on this Sunday past ministry time, which is when, you know, in our context in the vineyard, this is how we understand responding to the Holy Spirit. So we bring our gifts to one another, get a word for someone, some encouragement, some verse that you feel you're supposed to share with someone or whatever, or you have a need and you ask. And this is how we understand the response that the people had in Mount Sinai and all through the scriptures and in the New Testament, we still do it, still respond to the presence of God among us. But I just felt like I was supposed to go and ask my friend Todd to pray for healing for my hearing. People listening might not know, but I'm quite deaf. I wear hearing aids in both ears and it's good comedy for my family because I regularly get things very wrong when I don't have my hearing aids. And I'm good at lip reading, but let's be honest, it doesn't always work. Elephant shoes looks exactly like I love you. Right, or aloe vegetation sounds exactly like adult education to my ears. So I've embarrassed myself quite badly at times, trust me. But I thought, okay, I'm going to go and ask my friend Todd, who's had his own tremendous vulnerability with being sick this past year and just not having anything in the tank. And I thought, really go and ask him to pray for me for healing? Like, I don't even know if the guy's got any faith for it. But one body, many parts, I just felt it was what the Holy Spirit wanted me to do. And and Todd felt like it actually called him to some life to reach and pray for my healing, not just his own. Mm-hmm. Anyway, Monday morning, like I didn't experience, I didn't feel like anything happened. I just, it was a, an act of humility to go and ask someone to pray. But I actually heard the school bell behind my house on Monday morning. I, I can't remember ever hearing it mm-hmm. since I've moved into that house three years ago. So Who knows, maybe I am experiencing some healing, but the point is I'm never going to have the humility to reach for and ask for those things if I'm not in a gathering with other Christians. Right, and I I actually think we need people in our lives and in our form of Ecclesia that rub us the wrong way. I think if you don't have somebody that you think, I do not understand that person, I would question actually if we're truly having... Real Ecclesia. Now you see this in the in the New Testament that they worked things out. Paul and Apollos and Barnabas. Paul and Peter. Yeah, just like and there was this yeah, I don't know if I really agree with you on that. And I I love that kind of duking it out. I mean that might be a function of my own personality as well, but I but I often think we run when there are people that we have head on collisions with. We say, Oh well, that church is not for me anymore because I had it out with that. That's where that's why church splits happen, right? Yeah. Because this faction of people want to do it this way and this. But I think if we'd lean into that conflict a little bit more and just say, No, it's okay. This is this is all part of the church. This is the biblical historical yeah. narrative that we're not all going to see things eye to eye, but that doesn't mean that we're not tied together. Right. And that in no other context would I probably have a coffee with you or would I yeah. ever have a donut with you or would I and but that's amazing and beautiful and, and the fact that us. yes and the fact that I don't understand you yeah. is I mean I, I think it's a sign of the kingdom 
and we talked about this a little bit, it is a sign of the kingdom. I also think that that has to be borne out in the preaching. And I think this is a gain where we have misunderstood the purpose of the the preach in a gathering, yeah. you don't always have to agree with your pastor no. or whoever happens to be preaching. In fact, let's get technical for a second. This is something I teach when I I teach a course at Ambrose University for preaching, and it's a preaching and story course, and talk about what we call a comedic hermeneutic and a tragic hermeneutic. So when you preach, if you're if it's comedic hermeneutic, which is just technical language to say, if it's meant to just sort of make you feel good, if it's motivational speak, if it's like bless you, and if it just affirms your way of seeing things with a biblical way of seeing things, says, yeah, bless you. Like, bless you people today. We just want to encourage you in the Lord. And we just preach like that, just to bless people and encourage them, lift them up. That's what we call comedic hermeneutic. If you preach a tragic hermeneutic, you try to create dissonance. This is how the biblical narrative is, and this is how we might be at not fusing horizons, okay? So real distance and gap there. And it ought to provoke a question in the listener to say, I don't know if I agree with that. Or, gee, my life doesn't look like that. Or I've never had to wrestle that through with God. I would way rather be the pastor, and I'm not saying I don't want to encourage people or bless people, but... I want to be preaching a tragic hermeneutic on some level every single time that I'm bringing scripture because it's meant to sharpen us. It's meant to grow us. It's meant to awaken us to more of God. Now we've got Tony Robbins in the culture, right? Yeah. And I am Oprah a fan. and others. I am a fan. Sure. But, but the point is we've got all kinds of affirmation speak yeah. and motivational speak. That is not the role of the preaching in a gathering. The role of the preaching is to provoke you to think more deeply about your journey in faith and whether you are on a growing edge with Jesus. It's to carve spiritual maturity in us. I agree. Sort of. I I I see your face. She's like, ah, she wants to push back. Go ahead. I agree. But I also think the world is really hard. I think Monday to Saturday is hard for a lot of folks. And I think sometimes we, we do gather together because we're down in the dumps we're in the basement and i think sometimes what we come together is to be encouraged and sure but there the tragic hermeneutic might be that you've actually believed life sucks yeah. and you're reminded through the scriptures the non-fusing horizon is that life doesn't suck because god's overall and in all right right so i'm not saying let's not be encouraging okay and i'm not saying let's be negative and always preach be, on job for 52 right, weeks or of the like year beat people over the head with a baseball bat to sort of get ship shape with jesus i'm not talking about that i'm talking more but a provoking so that we're growing yeah and an awakening to god so we should leave encouraged because we heard something that made us think about me and jesus and where right. i'm at with him and whether my life is as toward him as I say it is, or if I'm welcoming his presence on a daily basis, or my eyes open, my ears open, my heart willing to obey, right? Right. That kind of thing. Maybe scripture would talk about it as a circumcising of our hearts. Right. Right? Beautiful Um, picture. Yeah, weird language. But you know, it's this metaphor to say always being raw and open to God. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what I want. And if I don't sit under some biblical teaching, on a regular basis, I lose that growth. <clears throat> I really do, because right. I just begin to believe my own press. I read the Bible, and I think that's really encouraging, and I interpret it however I want. And and if there's no, I would say that if there's no stinging in our hearts, then there is no growth. Right. Because all growth requires a bit of pain. And it requires other voices. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It requires other voices. So we have to gather with the people of God to be shaped by the people of God and God's manifest presence among us. And that goes right back to Mount Sinai. Right. Thanks for listening to another episode of Down to Earth. We hope you've enjoyed listening and feel inspired to grow in your relationship with God and to engage your life in ways that shape your culture and community. If you enjoyed today's episode, please take a moment and leave a review on iTunes. Not only does it let us know how we're doing, but it helps other people find the show. Remember, if you have any comments, questions, or feedback, please leave them in the comments on this episode at downtoearthpodcast.com.